Good morning, our saviors. It is, uh, it's nice to see you this morning. I, I was worried because I, I knew a few families would be out of town on vacation this week that we would be super low in numbers, but it's nice to see you guys gathered here this morning. I, I do wonder sometimes when people go on vacation, do they, do they go to church, you know, where they're at on vacation? I, I was forced to do that as a kid, so we'd be down in Florida at the beach. Oh yeah, Paul's pointing at himself, you had to do that too. Yeah, you're a pastor's kid, so I get that. And you'd, you know, my parents would look in the phone book, this is pre-internet, you know, they look in the phone book, oh, this looks like a good one, you'd go and you'd be like, oh, this is, this is awful. Um, so you'd go and you'd think, I'm on vacation, I can't just sleep in on a Sunday morning, but... Um, you know, this weekend was different for us. Instead of, uh, instead of uh, vacation and stuff like that, uh, my wife and I on our Friday date went and saw the new Mad Max movie. So um, did anyone remember seeing those, like the 80s ones with Mel Gibson? Yeah? All right. Very good. Very good. It was, uh, it was awesome. The, the big bad guy, the new bad guy in this one's named Dementis, which is a great bad guy name. Um, and I mentioned this just so that you know, like, if we're sitting up there during service and there's some silence and you hear it's me in my head traveling across the wastelands of the Australian outback you know with motorcycles and huge monstrous war rigs the size of monster trucks like you know shooting across and shooting flames and all kinds of stuff like that so um, it did provide a stark contrast to what we're talking about today which is Sabbath rest in Mad Max, there is no rest because this is a post-apocalyptic wasteland where everyone's scrabbling for survival. But we don't live in that reality, at least not yet. So we get to enjoy Sabbath rest. And so my hope is that you will get to engage with the idea of Sabbath today as we walk through this worship service together and we sing together and pray together and commune together. So I invite you to stand as we continue with our confession and forgiveness. <clears throat> Blessed, be Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen. You may remain standing as we sing our gathering song, O Day of Resting Gladness.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, throughout time you free the oppressed, heal the sick, and make whole all that you have made. Look with compassion on the world wounded by sin, and by your power restore us to wholeness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm hoping my voice will hold out here. I've been a little shaky. <laughs> um, the first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 5. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the second and third chapter. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck grains, heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then, they said, then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. 
The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The gospel of our Lord. You may be seated, and I think uh, we can invite the kids up for a children's sermon. So any kiddos that want to come up and hang out with me, you guys come on up. Hey, buddy. Are you having a good weekend so far? Yeah? Okay. Come on up, guys. You can come up, too. Hey, hey, I like your dress right there. That's really cool. I like that. Well, today we're talking about the Sabbath. Have you ever heard that word, Sabbath? Yeah, that's not a very common word, is it? Yeah. It's a day in which we rest. Here, come on up. You can come up. Come on up. You're in time. Right here. Yeah, you're good. You're good. All right. So a Sabbath is a day we rest. Have you ever rested before? Have you ever needed to rest? Have there ever been like a moment when you're like, oh, I got to take a break? Yeah. When was that? Was that like after you ran really hard and played really hard? Yeah, yeah. Was there like a break you needed from schoolwork when you worked your brain too hard? Yeah, that's what my kids say. They say, my brain is tired, and then they have to take a break. Yeah, what about a nap? Have you guys ever taken a nap? You don't take any naps? Oh, your poor mom, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> The parents need you guys to take naps. How about you? Have you ever taken a nap? Yeah. Yeah? How about you? Are you taking a nap? Yeah. Not very much? <laughs> she doesn't anymore, huh? All right. Yeah, sometimes we need to rest. Sometimes we need to rest our body. Sometimes that's by, like, taking a nap or just lying down. Sometimes we need to rest our mind, maybe by taking a break from schoolwork or something like that. Sometimes we need to rest our spirit. We need to just... Uh, not be in difficult situations. We need to be able to hang out with our family and hang out with our friends and not have anything to worry about. Have you guys ever worried about anything? You ever worried? Have you ever been nervous? Yeah? Yeah? Sabbath gives us a time to rest from those things. To say, you know what? I'm not going to worry about those things. I'm just going to be able to sit and relax and not worry about things. So today can be your Sabbath. Now, some people do their Sabbath on Sunday. Some people do it on a Saturday. Some people don't do it at all. Some people do it in different ways. But if you want to, you could think about rest today. Maybe think about taking a nap today when you go home. Is there any chance of that? No, but him, he'll take a nap. And him, yeah, you'll take a nap too, huh? The boys will take a nap while the girls watch him, huh? Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be good. All right. So take a rest today and allow your parents to have a rest, okay? All right, you guys can head back to your seats and your pews. Thanks for coming up today. In my mom's, uh, one of my mom's fabled sort of uh, picture directory sort of um, keepsake, you know, um, photo albums, there is a picture, well, I should say, my mom got really into like, I don't remember what they used to call it, but like the whole scrapbooking thing where you got like the acid-free cover things and you had the little special scissors that cut out things and you... You wrote little, like, captions for the people in the pictures, you know. Um, so my mom got really into that. So she's got a bunch of those photo albums. But in one, there's a picture, an old yellowing picture of me in overalls, probably um, five or six years old. And I'm out in a little, like, small field sort of pen area with several other kids about my age. And we're all running 
trying to catch a greased pig. And uh, this is the time-honored southern tradition of uh, greasing up a little piglet and letting that thing run around while everyone sort of delights in five- and six-year-olds fruitlessly trying to catch it. And then in the chance that one of them actually gets to it, of course, it slips out of their hands because it's greased. Um, and I thought about that picture this week as I read about this gospel reading and Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees. Because grabbing, grabbing and then wrestling a pig and holding on to it is not easy. That, that's what we did. I, there's a difference between wrestling and wrestling. Wrestling is what you do like with rules in high school and stuff like that, Greco-Roman wrestling. Wrestling is what you do when you're just scrapping around trying to get your hands on something. And I'm, remem- I'm reminded of that this week is Israel's real name means to wrestle with God. Israel means to wrestle with God. That's right there embedded in the name of the people that Jesus was born into. And so Jesus invites the Pharisees today in this gospel reading to wrestle with their notion of Sabbath. He comes in and he kind of interacts with the Pharisees and the other religious leaders at the temple. And he challenges that the Sabbath was made for humans, not the other way around. Healing this man with the withered hand that comes in is work that cannot wait till the next day. So Jesus goes, is it lawful on the Sabbath to give life or to take it? And the Pharisees sort of sit silent in response to that. They have no response. But Jesus there is asking a very um, rabbinic question. He's a rabbi, and this is a question that rabbis would often ask and debate about. But the Pharisees have no answer because they're not there for a real discussion. They're not there for wrestling with, um, you know, moral dilemmas or different ideas or ethical questions about the Sabbath of what you can or can't do. They're there with an agenda. They want to conspire against Jesus. They want to plot to end his life and ministry. But the bizarre thing about this question is, the Pharisees have no answer, but Jesus is not asking a question that's all that novel or unique or profound. I want to tell you about a, uh, a, an idea or a um, theological stance that was very common at the time of Jesus among the rabbis. There's a Jewish word here that uh, I have a slide for that I'm going to show you. Now, <clears throat> at the top in italics is, is the Hebrew word. And uh, I thought, if I'm going to say these words for the congregation, I should figure out how to pronounce these. Um, and they do not, they are not pronounced the way that I would have thought. Um, I used this really great tool you learn in seminary called YouTube. And um, <laughs> I looked this up, and it turns out there's a lot of modern rabbis who have videos saying these words, especially during the pandemic. They were using this word because it means save a soul, save a life. And they were urging their congregations during the early days of the pandemic to shelter in place and to wear masks and stuff like that. Um, so they were using this term because it's a well-understood or well-referenced term in the rabbinic tradition. And um, this, these Hebrew words, pikwash uh, nefesh, is the idea that has continued through to this day but predates Jesus, save a soul, save a life. And the idea there is that this principle in the Jewish law is that preservation of human life overrides virtually any other religious law, any other religious rule in Judaism. So in the event that a person is in critical danger, most laws, including the Ten Commandments, become inapplicable if they would hinder the ability of someone to save someone else or save themselves. So Jesus argues that's what he's doing here with the, wither, the man with the withered hand. He may not be about to die, but Jesus is engaging in a life-giving act using save a soul, save a life uh, theology to go and breathe life into this man's existence and to give him the opportunity to interact with the world without the withered hand. So, 
Jesus referencing this idea, which was held by most of the rabbis of his time, is not really doing some necessarily new or novel concept. He's just inviting the Pharisees into this fleshing out of a pre-existing notion. Life-giving acts take precedence over the letter of the law. The spirit of the law trumps the letter of the law. And the spirit of the law is to give life. That's what the Sabbath is for. The Sabbath is there to give life through rest. Now, when we say that Jesus was not doing something necessarily new in this statement, I'm reminded of a a quote from C.S. Lewis. So I've got a quote up here I want to share with you. Really great moral teachers never do introduce new moralities. It is quacks and cranks who do that. The real job of every moral teacher is to keep on bringing us back, time after time, to the old simple principles which we are all so anxious not to see. Like bringing a horse back and back to the fence it has refused to jump, and I think there he means like a hurdle that, uh, that horses are trained to jump over, or bringing a child back and back to the bit in its lesson that it wants to shirk. Jesus comes to these Pharisees and to us this morning And doesn't always bring something new. You won't always hear something new in the Gospels like, oh, I've never heard that before. I've never thought of that novel concept before. But it will bring you back to the truths that you've heard before but forgotten. The beauty that you've seen before but have um, let fade into your memory and have forgotten it. Jesus brings us back and back again to those things. Now, I thought about this this quote, not only because it was applicable to uh, what Jesus is doing here, but also just because I really like C.S. Lewis. Um, He was probably my favorite author in my late teens and and throughout most of my 20s. Um, He wrote, of course, you know, like the Chronicles of Narnia, you know, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And uh, I've got a picture of him here, actually, that we can can share with you. He was a thoroughly British academic man, professor at Oxford, but uh, he fought in World War I and saw the destruction of the landscape around with the sewer, sort of the new artillery and all the things that were available to the armies in World War I. And then in World War II, he rose to prominence in England because he was on the radio. He was sort of the voice on the radio reassuring people while Germany was bombing the tar out of the British Isles that uh, he was letting them know Things are going to be okay. This is how we get through this. And then he would sort of go into uh, some really simple aspects of Christianity. As an Anglican, he sort of gave the perspective of what Christianity was. And so that quote I shared with you is from uh, a book called, probably his most popular book, Mere Christianity, um, which is a collection of those radio broadcasts during World War II. And then uh, (laughs) I also like his... uh, Space Trilogy, and I got this collected set from Chad Joel, who does like estate sales and stuff, and he couldn't sell this awesome collection of books, so he gave it to me. Um, (laughs) And I uh, already had a copy, but I really like this one, because it's very kind of uh, 60s-ish in its style, Um, but uh, liked it so much that we included an image from uh, that series uh, on the album art of our, my band's third album, but... um, In this quote that we heard from C.S. Lewis, he goes in and he points out that the uniqueness of Christ, and by extension of Christianity, isn't in some unparalleled moral code that we receive, because Christianity is not primarily about a moral code. He really hinges his whole point in that quote on the phrase, we are all so anxious not to see. Our problem is not that we lack information, even the information that could be found in a holy book like the Bible. Neither is our problem that we lack self-discipline or self-love or good examples. The thing that amazes us in our moments of sanity is how much we resist seeing the thing we know to be true. We know, for instance, that our anger or our impatience is only going to make a situation worse. But in times of frustration, we do it anyway, don't we? We know that lying always complicates things. But in a pinch, we fool ourselves into thinking that we can get away with it this time. 
The inspired part of Christ's teaching is not its superior list of do's and don'ts. He doesn't come to the Pharisees and say, this is your list of do's and don'ts on the Sabbath. Here's a better list of do's and don'ts on the Sabbath. Rather, we see the inspiration in his words and their unique ability to open willfully blind eyes, like the Pharisees or like ours sometimes, open our eyes to the truth of our own condition. And when we understand that perspective, we start to see the power in the words and actions of Christ. It's not the moral teaching that he gives today that's unique. It's the view of human nature and the remedy that's unique. You think of most moral teachers can be classified as sort of a, a self-help sort of thing. And I, I know we've talked a bit about self-help books in the past. And Jesus parts ways with those great moral teachers and instead invites us to move from good intentions and from those those sort of resolutions we make at New Year's that don't last very long, and instead invites us into new lives, transformed radically by grace, into lives that are uh, invitations into the abundant life, life-giving acts like he does with this man with the withered hand this morning. So we get, I think, two notions of Sabbath this morning. These are two notions of Sabbath that we can sort of use as we think about what it means to engage in Sabbath practices. My hope is that you don't have a packed day lined up today after you leave church. Maybe you do. It's okay if you do. But my hope is that you've got some time to rest today or yesterday or tomorrow or some point. And as we think about Sabbath, there's two different ways we can think about this, and they come right from the two different main renderings of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Were you guys aware that there's two different recountings of the Ten Commandments? Okay, I see one nodding head there, Ken, very good. Um, So there's Exodus 20, and there's Deuteronomy 5. Now, Exodus 20 is the one I learned growing up, because that tends to get grouped into a four and six. So there's Ten Commandments, and the way I learned them was your first four are relating to God, and your last six are relating to between you and other humans, and... um, There's a whole different numbering there than the way that most Lutherans and also most Catholics and other mainline Protestants do it, which is from Deuteronomy 5. In Deuteronomy 5, it's grouped into 3 and 7. And so at the end, you've got, uh, for instance, the way I learned it was the last commandment, the 10th commandment, was thou shalt not covet, and that was one commandment. But the way you probably learned it in confirmation with your catechism was the ninth and 10th commandments were both do not covet. It's different things. Don't covet that, but also don't covet that, you know. So that got broken into two because there's no numbering. Moses didn't walk down from Mount Sinai with like, you know, Roman numerals on there, you know. Uh, so we've kind of taken a numbering. There is no title, Ten Commandments, you know. So we get these two different renderings and two different ways of thinking about Sabbath, but also two different rules in the uh, two different recountings of the Ten Commandments about why Sabbath should be practiced. So in Exodus 20, the one I grew up with, Sabbath was rendered as rest. The reason given in Exodus 20 for thou shalt, uh, what it, thou shalt honor the Sabbath, uh, thou shalt not do any work on the Sabbath, uh, is that God created for six days, and then what did God do on the seventh day? Rested. Rested from all the work that God had done. And Exodus sort of implies God did it, and that's a template for you. Work for six days, and then rest on the seventh. Deuteronomy, which you heard Maggie read this morning, doesn't say anything about the creation story. In Deuteronomy 5, and that recounting of the Ten Commandments, when you get down there to the, uh, what would be it, in the third commandment and that rendering, the fourth commandment, the way I learned it, is that you should take a Sabbath, you should honor the Sabbath, because, not because God rested on the seventh day, but because, remember, when you were slaves in Egypt, God brought you up out of the land of Egypt and out of slavery, and so you should rest because you are reminded that you are no longer in slavery. You no longer have to work nonstop like your slave masters made you do. And now you should remember to do the same thing when you have people come into your midst. When people come in to your land that you're going into, into this promised land, and they join your community, don't treat them the same way the Egyptians treated you. Don't make them work nonstop. You should have a day of rest, and so should they. That day of rest is for all. 
So that second idea, the first, the first one from Exodus 20, Sabbath as rest. So we can think of rest. Hopefully you get a chance to rest. But then Deuteronomy 5, the second idea of the Sabbath, Sabbath is liberation. Taking a Sabbath rest is a reminder that we are no longer enslaved and forced to toil without end, to work without rest. Deuteronomy makes clear that Sabbath keeping is meant for the improved welfare of all. For the abundant life which Christ later comes and promises. For a higher quality of life. So that all can enjoy things and not just scratch for existence. Not just go from thing to thing to thing to thing, going down a list of to-dos and chores. The thing is, sometimes it's not other people that do that to us. Sometimes we do it to ourselves. I'm guilty of that. My wife thinks I'm crazy, and I probably am. Uh, we will go on vacation, and she says, you just can't relax, can you? And I say, I'm hopeless. You know, I get up, and it's like, okay, boys, you want to go for a bicycle ride? You want to go on a jog? You want to do this? You want to do that? I am not good at sitting still. So I have to learn how to rest, because... I enslave myself, and you might be the same way, whether that's with the job, whether that's with watching grandkids or grand dogs, whether that's with um, doing chores around the house. However it is that you find yourself too busy and too anxious and too overburdened, Jesus says, come to me and find rest. Come to me and enter into abundant life and take off the load that others have heaped on you or that you've heaped on yourself and set it aside for a while. Rest your legs. Rest your, rest your spirit. Rest your mind. Take a break. And that's a sign of liberation that we're all invited into. So Christ comes to us this morning just like he came to the Pharisees, just like he came to the man with the withered hand. And he invites us into a life, leads us in all creation toward restoration towards a sense of peace, towards the abundant life, which we sometimes have heard about but have chosen to forget that we're so anxious not to see. And Christ leads us once again gently back to that abundant life, which it is our privilege to enter into. This is good news for us, friends in Christ. It is the gospel of our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of the day, The Church of Christ in Every Age.
may be seated for the prayers. We come before the triune God to pray for our communities, ourselves, and our world. Guide your church to expressions of faith that bring rest and release. Teach your faithful people to be attentive to the spiritual, physical, and societal weariness of our neighbors that we proclaim your grace through tangible acts of mercy and justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Keep us mindful of the rhythms of nature as the days lengthen and the seasons shift toward summer. Grant relief to areas facing flooding or drought and bring favorable weather for the flourishing of crops, gardens, and orchards. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Where there is affliction in our world, bring healing. Where world leaders are perplexed, bring clarity of vision. Give a spirit of discernment to political advisors, institutional researchers, economic analysts, and all vocations that inform the work of governments and policymakers. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Provide wholeness and respite to all who are weary, those who struggle in any way, and those who care for them, especially Angie, Ray, Janice, Bev, and Linda. Strengthen first responders and healthcare workers in their times of exhaustion or frustration. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Stir our hearts toward abundant generosity among neighbors who experience hunger and food insecurity. Bless feeding ministries and community food efforts, especially community gardens, farmers markets, food pantries, and little free pantries. Open both our hearts and our tables. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We remember the communion of saints whose lives made visible the saving life of Jesus Christ. Guide us by their example to embody the treasure of your love for the sake of our world until we come to our final rest in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now the peace of Christ be with you always. Share that peace with each other.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Just a few words of instruction as we prepare for communion, as we uh, have been doing for a little while now at the 8 o'clock service. As the ushers dismiss you, come down the center aisle, receive the bread and wine, and then return to your seats through the diagonal aisles and drop your... Ooh, if we can get someone to move that uh, white ball there over there, then I think we're good. Unless you guys just want to get your steps in and take the long way back, you know, <laughs> go out towards the outside edge there. <laughs> Sabbath rest, Sabbath rest. Watch the number of steps you take today. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And of course, if you need a gluten-free option, we'll have that sitting right here so you can ask uh, Bill or myself, and we will grab that tray for you, and you'll be able to have a gluten-free wafer that way. So now, friends in Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant, which is shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ has set this table with more than enough for all. So come, you may be seated.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I've got a couple announcements for you uh, before we go. Um, they all, well, most of them come from uh, here, this, uh, this handout. Um, next Sunday, we got a couple different neat things coming up. We will have a bake sale for the National Youth Gathering kids that are going, kids and adults. Um, they're going to be going, let's see, we're headed out to New Orleans on July 16th. So it's mid-July, and it's a Tuesday that we fly out, and then we come back on a Saturday. And uh, it's going to be hot down there in July, so keep them, us, in your prayers. Um, but we'll be having a bake sale on next Sunday. So if you want to come and maybe bring a little bit of money or something and buy, I don't know what all is going to get made. Um, my guess is that the parents are going to do a lot of the baking, but kids might do some as well. Um, I don't know which you prefer, so you'll have to find out what's there and who made what and what's available. But um, that'll be through like a free will offering. And then uh, that'll be the same Sunday, next Sunday, that we do our high school graduate recognition. So every year we've got our kids who are graduating from high school and we recognize them. So they're going to come up during second service next week on June 9th. And then finally, I want to say um, I appreciate so much being done by volunteers. Um, in the past, we've occasionally had like a, a volunteer uh, appreciation dinner or something like that. And with all the stuff going on the last month or two, we didn't really have the capacity to do something like that. But I wanted you guys to know that you are seen and you are appreciated. Now that we have a volunteer coordinator on staff again who's sending out emails, and you guys are doing a great job of signing up and Sign Up Genius, and Paul's got his group at the AV booth that he sends out a list for, and Matt's got his group that he sends out for acolytes, and all these different groups. It's a whole lot of moving parts, and you guys are really wonderful, and we appreciate all that's done on Sunday and throughout the week. So thank you, volunteers. We really appreciate it. Uh, maybe we'll be able to have the mental brain space to do it next year, uh, like in May, uh, sort of a volunteer appreciation dinner. But thank you. You are seen and acknowledged and appreciated. Now I invite you to hear these words of blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may remain standing as we sing our sinning song, Go to the World.
Go in peace. You are the body of Christ.